Hey everybody, this is the Sliders Review, and I'm here today to talk to you about Does Star Trek Discovery feel genuine about their diversity or do they exploit it just for like the checkmark system? So this has been a debate that has been raging on from Star Trek um, Discovery ever since season one. And that is the use of diversity. Is it genuine or are they merely just checking something off the list just to be like, hey, look who we got. Aren't we special? We did it before you did. And so that's a, like a reasonable debate. It's something that's been debating a lot in a lot of recent TV shows, um, especially in the CW. Um, the CW is very known for like doing the check mark system and stuff just to like make people like like them worship them and nominate them from like awards and stuff like that however there are some times in the cw where it is legit genuine and stuff like that um like take nancy drew it's legit um uh, it's true diversity when they have like say Bess, who is like a lesbian or bisexual i'm still not really 100 percent sure about that um, because of that guy she was with back in um, London. But yeah, for the most part, she is a lesbian. And when she had her first relationship in season one, it was very genuine. The second season relationship was kind of stupid because she fell in love with a ghost. Just watch one of my Nancy Drew videos about that. <laughs> I don't got time to talk about Nancy Drew right now. Nancy Drew is pissing me off right now to where I stopped watching it. And so like... um. Now on Discovery, we have seen our fair share of like diversity. We've seen um, a plethora of LGBT um, characters, a gay couple, a non-binary person, uh, now a transgender person, which I had no idea. Like I will get into that later because I was confused. That's why I messed up on some of my older videos about that. Um, I kept getting the two mixed up and stuff until I actually decided to like sit down and actually like research and research it really hard and in depth, which is kind of hard because um, there isn't much info at that time when these two characters was introduced. Cause I don't even think they had a Wikipedia page at that time until much later. So anyway, we've seen, um, let's see what else. We've seen like a multitude of like um, races, not alien races, talking about like race, race, like Hispanics, Blacks, um, Asian, stuff like that. Um, We've seen people of different body sizes and stuff. And the question is, are they genuine or is it the chip mark system? I would have to say both yes and no. Like here's a prime example of how the CW um, uses diversity, the chip mark system, but it's kind of like forced and it's never genuine and it never flows. Like I used to watch a show called um, Nancy Drew. I stopped halfway into the third season. I couldn't take it no more. The third season is just like terrible. But um, so like there's like, you know, there's been LGBT people there before and they handled them very properly and everything, right? But then in the last episode I watched of season three, Nancy got introduced to this one female character. And so she introduced herself, like she said her name. And then as soon as she said her name, she's all like, I'm just gonna make up a name, right? Random name, um, Sarah Perkinson. Pronoun, she, her. And I'm just thinking to myself, why did she say that? Like, why did she tell Nancy her pronoun is she, her? I've never met a person who introduces themselves, but then literally tells the person, hey, this is my pronoun. Like, that was literally like a forced, like thing to acknowledge it just to show that the CW is so diverse, but the CW has fake diversity and it's like they literally push the narrative to where it's never genuine and it just they and people feel like props on that show. Um, they have been outspoken too, especially on Riverdale and stuff. And it's just like, it's kind of like the way to handle that scene better would have been like if Nancy mispronounced her and then she corrected Nancy by like, oh, um, you might not know this, but you know, my pronoun is she, her and everything. And that would have been a better way to handle that. See, the C, see the CW is actually owned by CBS. Um, CBS is the parent company and CW is the children company. So I guess what's ever good for the children company is good enough for the parent company and stuff. Now, the great thing about Star Trek is that Star Trek is known for having like diversity. 
it's always been that way since season, uh, not season one, <laughs> the first series, um, TOS. You know, on that show, they had like a woman who was black. They had a man who was from Russia, which was very controversial at that time for both those characters, but they was on the show. They had an Asian man from, uh, who is, I believe, a Japanese descent. They had um, one person who was half Jewish and the other person who was Jewish. And of course, they had like white characters and stuff like that. I don't think they ever had any Hispanic characters. Um, and this was done back in the 60s when a time when there was not allowed to be any diversity. Now, even though they had diversity on the show, of course, back then, um, only certain characters got to like shine and certain characters got to do more than others. And some of their diverse characters, they really didn't get to shine all that much, but still knew who they were. Um, this is, of course, is um, Sulu. Um, I have a hard time pronouncing her name. Ohura. <laughs> and Chekhov. Like, Chekhov was kind of like comedic relief at times or just a dumping person um, and stuff. But he's like, they didn't have that much to do on the show. But every now and then they got to, like, you know what I'm saying? But it was rare. Now, of course, this trend of racial diversity will continue with Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, um, what's the, um, Voyager, and, like, Enterprise. But even though they had diverse characters, you still mainly had, like, a, um, white, like, characters, um, at the front center, whether they was white American, white British, white, um, Irish or whatever, you know what I'm saying, or Russian and stuff. And so, like, you had characters like, you know, Next Generation, they had two black characters. And then when they added Guinan, who was a recurring character, it kind of made it, like, for the third. And then, so, you know, they had, like, an Asian character prominent in both Enterprise and in Voyager. But it's like, even though they had these diverse characters, they rarely did like anything like hoshi i don't remember much about her other than that time she fed like um the doctor's like pet <laughs> and everything now i remember her a little bit more from the mirror universe because she took over towards the end but other than that i don't remember her and of course mayweather <laughs> that man didn't do nothing and everything i think mayweather was the black one it's been a good while um and then, you know, in Deep Space Nine, you know, of course, we had, like, a black commander slash captain. So he was very prominent on the show. And we had, like, a lot of strong females on that show with Dax and Kira Norris. And then, of course, you know, um, Miles was on there. And he's, is he Irish or Scottish? I want to say Irish. And so, like, you know, you had, like, Worf, who later on came on, who made like, another black character. And so, like... And then, of course, Next Generation, you had um, um, Jordy and you had Worf. Worf was kind of just like the dumb Klingon who just wanted to, like, smash stuff. And then you had Jordy, who was the smart engineer dude, but um, he was relative just to that of engineering. And he couldn't get the girl, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? And then, of course, Voyager had the very first female captain. And... Um, and so that was very prominent. And then they had like um, Balana, who was like a female engineer. And so like, you know, every while and then you, you would have more strides and stuff like that. Now, now in terms of say discovery, they really pushed for the diversity racial level, which was great. You know what I'm saying? You had, first you had like an Asian captain female which is something we've never had. A, we had an Asian captain once, Sulu, but you know, that was in the movies and stuff. And then Harry in different timelines and stuff. And so, but we, we never had one like full time, full time on screen until they killed her off. <laughs> and then of course there's Michael Burnham, who is the literal star and savior of like the universe and stuff. And she's played by like a black female. And so on the rest of the crew you have diversity you know you have um reese who is asian you have bryce who is black you have i still don't know how, how to say her last name so i'm just gonna call her um lieutenant um or now commander i should say lieutenant commander um joanne she's the operations officer the black lady with the um uh, with the long hair 
And then you have the doctor, um, Colbert, which I don't know what his race is. I don't know that dude's half black, half white, half like Hispanic, half Jewish, half anything. I, don't, I have no idea what he is, but his last name is Cruz. So that would make sense for him to be Hispanic. But then again, Tom Cruz is his last name, Cruz, and he don't look Hispanic. So I don't know. I have to look into that. And so then also you now have book and you have the other female doctor who occasionally will come in and she sub when Dr. Colbert, well, Colbert was um, killed and stuff. But here's the thing about the diversity in Discovery. They have other races in this show, but they never do nothing and they never get to say much. Every once in a while, they'll get like a throwaway line and that's it. And so it's like they lived up to the Star, the Star Trek standard of what Gene Roddenberry wanted, diversity. Um, we know why it was limited in TOS. It started becoming more prominent in the other seasons where they actually got something to do. However, now it's like they don't get nothing to do. The only person on that show who is diverse and uh, um race wise is of course michael burnham because she is the literal star of the show and the other characters they, they even know their bridge crew they never get to say or do nothing like at all so and then of course the main characters of this show is of course um i would have to say burnham saru tilly well no tilly no more because she left um stamets um, and that's about it. And of course, all the other characters that I just named are white. So this would have to fall in that whole chip mark system of diverse races. They wanted like all these like um, people of different ethnicities and stuff, but these people never get to do anything. Now, Giorgio, she was Asian, of course, and she got to do some good stuff. Well, not necessarily good, but when I say good stuff, I mean she got to like actually act. <laughs> but um, now she's gone to do her own show, if that's still going to be a thing or not, which I don't know why they're going to make a Section 31, and that's supposed to be villains. So I don't get this whole giving villains their own movie TV show crap. Like I don't understand that. But she's supposed to be turning over a new leaf, so who knows. And so it's like when she left... The diversity train really like ended with just Burnham for the most part because when it comes to race because you know whenever they have like these other guest stars that are like white and stuff like that they get to like do stuff which is, I don't know why people keep complaining talking about oh they're getting replaced and there aren't that many white people at the uh, conference table when they had like a meeting and I'm like have you not seen this show have you not seen the people who actually get to talk <laughs> and stuff I don't, I don't get it and so yeah, I would have to check this off as the, it's the check mark system when it comes to like false, like diversity among the show, because if they, it's, it's, it's the same way the CW does it. When they have all these different races on the show, they're just there just to be that race and they're not there to do anything else. And it's like fake diversity around like the board, especially when you get into Riverdale, which I don't watch no more. I stopped watching after the second season and if you know anything about Riverdale, my other videos, you know, they screw up big time when it comes to diversity. Now let's get to another subject. Um, people with disabilities. Um, is this genuine or are they merely just doing it for, hey, look who we have in the show. Aren't we special and everything? Now, when it comes to disabilities, as far as I can tell in Star Trek Discovery, there's only been like four characters. Two are similar. You have, I don't even remember what season this is. It probably was season one. Um, you have the guy with this strange thing over his eyes. It's like this big mechanical device. And so people took that as a nod to the most, as him being blind, and a nod to the most famous blind person in Star Trek history, Geordi LaForge. So and then... You have two characters who was in a wheelchair. Now, one, I believe, is, in fact, paraplegic. Um, and the other one who was in... Um, I don't know if he was or not. I have not researched it yet. 
And then of course, there is the fourth and last person, autism with Tilly. So, let's go to the blind dude first, since I named him first. Um, actually, I don't even know the blind dude's name. In fact, I don't even know if he's blind. But many Star Trek fans have picked this up as that's the early prototype for a visor. So let's just go with that, because that makes the most sense. Um, I don't know if Jordy's visor was new at that time. I know it was new for TNG and Star Trek, but I don't know if it's the first time they ever had like a, um, like a version of it. So let's just say, hey, this is back in like 22nd century. Hey, this is the prototype, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like, okay, fine. Um, is he going to be prominent like Jordy? Is he going to do like really cool stuff with his visors? Are there going to be storylines where you have to use his visor to get out of a sticky situation? Nope. None whatsoever. This dude was just shown for a couple of seconds and that's it. Nobody knows his name. Nobody even knows if he's really blind. Nobody knows what that thing is on the eyes. They literally just did that as like an homage to Jordy and everything. And this homage could very well backfire. Now I look at this as more of a homage. Uh, I don't really look at this as exploiting like uh, a person with a disability and stuff. Um, however, like I said before, the fact that they've never done anything with this character can fall in line with the backlash of, okay, this is exploitation. And I'm pretty sure people have been vocal because when it comes to us Star Trek fans and whether you love or hate Discovery, you remember this guy <laughs> you know what i'm saying and so it's kind of like why show somebody with this cool thing because that was the, like one of the most star trekish things you know that thing on his face around his eyes and stuff and they did absolutely nothing with that and it was a missed opportunity they could have had him guest star they could have had him being a recurring character he could have been some kind of plot device, something, but they squashed it because they didn't want to. They just wanted to show, hey, look what we got. Here's a nice little homage and this and stuff like that. Now, they are going to make up for that when it comes to Star Trek Strange New Worlds because they're going to have an Andorian who is going to be literally blind and he is played by an actor who is literally blind. So, this show has not came out yet. Um, so we don't know exactly what big role he's going to have on the show. Is he going to be like a discovery, um, bridge officer where they just sit there, touch the little panels and don't say much of anything and do much of anything. Only time will tell when it comes to that. So fingers crossed, they actually get this dude some good stuff. He could very well be the Spock data of the show if they do him right. Now, here's one that I think they exploited big time. The dude in the wheelchair. I don't even remember what season this was. I think it might have been in the third season. Um, Giorgio was there. And so, at first, you kind of don't even spot this dude. Because you will have a main cast member of the show walking and talking. And then, all of a sudden, if you look closely in the background, there's like a person who is short sitting in a chair, a wheelchair, and they're wheeling. And it's like, oh, okay, I think I see a person wheeling in a wheelchair, but you're not really sure. But then, they let us know for sure when there's an empty corridor. And all of a sudden, we see this person in a wheelchair just zip on past the camera. And then your first reaction is, did I just see what I thought I saw? And then your second reaction is, oh, it is what I saw. Um, who is this person? Uh, what did they do on the show? Like, who? what's this person's name? Don't know. <laughs> this person has never been shown, like, again. Um, and so it's like, who is this person? I don't think this person has a name um, on IMBD. And so they literally just want to show, hey, you know, we have a person in a wheelchair and we hired this person who is diverse. And um, so, like, you know, um, here we go. <laughs> but they don't do nothing with that dude. And so it's kind of like, what was the purpose in, like, showing that? And it just feels like they just did that to like check something off their list and be praised for. But that's no praise because this person doesn't do anything. We don't know how this person got in a wheelchair. 
Um, we don't understand why he's in a modern day wheelchair because this is supposed to be in the future of all things. And it's kind of like, why is he in a modern day wheelchair? And so I really feel like when they, when they put emphasis on that empty corridor and had him literally zip on by, that was supposed to be an attention seeker and stuff. And, you know, then later, if, if that was season three, I, can, I honestly can't remember now. But then I know later on in season three, they had that one scientist dude and he was in a wheelchair and he was a villain. And then he went from being a villain to like uh, um, turn on to the good side within seconds. Bad story writing. Um, now he had a little bit more prominent role. Um, I don't remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> because this is discovery and you just don't remember people's names because they don't really tell you that much and he was really close friends with the main villain of that season and he betrayed her and stuff and so it's like okay for the first dude I, I, I that was exploitation but with the second dude it actually seemed genuine um, and I think they even gave a backstory as to how he got in his wheelchair. So, okay, like, I get on props for that. At least they went into, like, that aspect. You know what I'm saying? But, of course, they killed his... I think they killed him off. <laughs> I, I can't really remember. But I'm pretty sure he's dead. And so they killed him off. And it's like... That's it? <laughs> and it's all like... <laughs> That's it. And I don't even know if this dude's really paraplegic or not. I have to look into that and stuff. And so if he's not, then that's totally messed up. But if he is, then okay, cool. I'll give you props again for that. But then back to the first dude who just zipped around in the corridor. Like, why show that if you're not even going to give him no lines, no nothing? Because there was a very famous person in a wheelchair in Star Trek history in Deep Space Nine. She was from an alien species where the gravity is different on her planet than it is everywhere else in the galaxy. So it's like she can walk around easily on her planet, but when she leaves her planet and goes in place else, the gravity of every place else is so like thick on her that it literally just like suppresses her to the ground. So she has to be in a wheelchair and everything. And when she's in her actual quarters on Deep Space Nine, she turns off the gravitational um, thing so she can just float around and stuff. And it was more than just that. She was like a scientist and everything. She was helping on a very important um, device and everything or something or another. And she actually had like an, a legit storyline. And we got to know stuff about her. And not only that, but one of the characters on the show, the doctor, had like a romantic interest in her. So that gave her something to do and made her genuine. And so this is like a debate you always hear so much before. And I will get into another video about that. Because um, somebody said that Star Trek Discovery is a love child to that of Deep Space Nine. And I get what they're saying with that. But then somebody also said, um, why do people hate Discovery, but they don't hate Deep Space Nine? One, people did used to hate Deep Space Nine. And two, they no longer hate it because they realized something. Um, it still felt like Star Trek. Like, even though it was different, they still acted like Starfleet officers. And, and I'll get into that in another video later. Anyway, so. So my thing is, with the dude who was zipping around, who's an actual Starfleet officer on this ship, why couldn't they give him a storyline or something like that, like they did that woman from Deep Space Nine? And that's because the writers don't care. They just wanted to show and not tell. And they wanted to show, to check something off their list and be like, worship us. We're special now because we have a person who is diverse. I mean, in Family Guy and in Stream Ghostbusters, they have two prominent characters that are in wheelchairs and they actually do stuff with them. One's a cop and one's a ghostbuster. And these came out in the 90s and they have more representation of showing a paraplegic person than that of like discovery and stuff. And that's like really embarrassing. So it's kind of like they could at least do something with that guy. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, like... Even though the writing isn't the way it needs to be on this one show I'm going to mention, at least they had diversity and actually kind of tried to do something with it in the confines of that of a kid show. I'm talking about Power Rangers Dino Fury. They broke two different grounds. One, they had a person who is autistic and they was running one of those special Olympic things. 
And so even though she wasn't prominent in the episode, um, at least they was willing to show a person who was different and have her have some speaking lines and learn just a little tiny bit about her. But they couldn't, you know, they have to get going with the show because it's only 20 minutes and they have to do the powering stuff. And then they introduced the very first LGBT Power Ranger character um, midway into the series and stuff. And she's been pretty prominent since then. She's gone on dates. She's, well, they don't really kiss on Power Rangers. They're not allowed. Only in the first season they were allowed to, but now they're just allowed to do the cheat stuff. And they hold hands and they actually show that they are in a relationship and stuff. Now that gets me to my last person I mentioned, Tilly and her autism. The gay couple on the show, the doctor and Stamets. They are genuine. Like you can tell they actually took time to actually write a real relationship um, with these two characters. Um, they don't, you don't really learn much about none of these characters. Like, the only person you really learn about is Saru and Burnham, that's it. So we don't really know their backstory, but we know they're in a relationship. And it's very genuine, just like Keiko and O'Brien was. And, but the only problem I have with their relationship is they never argue. They're always happy and lovey-dovey and stuff. And that's the same way Adira and Gray is. They're always happy and lovey-dovey. It's kind of like, no, people argue. Now, the only time Stamets and Colbert ever argued is when Colbert came back from the dead, um, being cloned by the Spore Drive in season two, and he was pissy towards like Stamets and um, Ash Tyler and stuff. After they kumbaya each other, um, they never argued since then. And, you know, it's just kind of like, it's a genuine relationship, but it's not 100% realistic. They don't never argue about anything or have a disagreement about anything. Nobody is that perfect. Not even in the Star Trek universe. Now, Tilly and her autism. In season one of Discovery, when she was a cadet and later made an ensign, there was an article online about does Tilly have autism? that she checks off all the traits of having it. So I went and I checked out the article that talked about Tilly and autism. And apparently, okay, so this is what had happened. People assume she was autistic on the spectrum or has some type of like Asperger's or something like that. The actress stated that even though it was not the writer's intention, she feels honored that people could relate to her character in that way. So, with that said, at least the writers were aware of this fact. However, it is odd that, like, so many people would assume that Tilly had, like, Asperger's or some type of autism. So, it's kind of like the writers wrote her with some type of goal in mind. And those traits are very similar to a person who normally has that. So, thing is, we'll probably never really truly 100% know, and they'll never admit it, because then, of course, they will look like jerks for making her, like, the goofball of the show who would have something like that. Now, let's get into weight. Um, I just posted this in my last video when it comes to Tilly and her weight. Um, because are they genuine with having the actual person who um, has some pounds on them being in Starfleet? Now, in no way, shape, or form am I making fun of Tilly or Adira when it comes to weight. I love big women. I love my series from Mary Wiseman. I'm a huge Mary Wiseman fan. I just don't like Tilly. <laughs> and so, like, when it comes to weight, now, in the first season, Tilly wasn't that big. Um, she had some weight to her, but she was very slim. And then going into the second season, she was still slim and had a little weight to her. But then halfway into the second season, she started gaining some weight. And then in the third season, she really gained some weight. And then in the fourth season, she kind of lost a little bit and gained a little bit. Um, and this has been, people have literally made fun of her, the actress, um, because of this, which is just low down in my opinion, because most of the people who are making fun of her are big themselves. And not only that, but there's no reason to put that like mental stress on a person for gaining weight. First things first, I've said this before, paychecks taste great. This is her big 
starring role. She's done other stuff before, but it's been like minor. This is the first time she's ever been in a series, and of course, she's gonna get paid more money than she normally does, which means she's gonna buy more food. She can finally eat. Like, instead of being a starving artist, she can go to all these fancy restaurants and eat their fattening food. So of course she's gonna put on the weight. This happens with a lot of celebrities. Uh, when you see them start to like gain and drop and gain and drop um, in different TV shows. The dude who plays Shelton and the Big Bang Theory. Uh, I don't even know what season this was, but it was the one where he was playing bongos and stuff like that. And he started gaining weight in that season. Then he lost it again. But before that, he was like super skinny and stuff. It just is what happens when you start getting paid more money and you can actually go places and eat. So I don't know why Mary Wiseman gained weight. I don't care because she looks great in my opinion, but she did gain weight. And um, the only problem I have with this is um, one, that marathon she won in the second season, which made no sense because the dude was way more muscular than her and she stopped to go talk to some ghost alien thing. So there's no way she could have caught up in time, but yet she won it. That made no sense. And the only minor problem I do have with that is that in Star Trek, they have the most advanced medical science ever. Like they have stated before, there is no more disease. There's no more this and that. Um, people are in good health in the future. So that didn't make sense to see a person on earth who's like bigger and like, you know, being Starfleet cause they're supposed to have good medical stuff. Now, of course, in the movies, people started gaining weight. William Shatner, he gained himself some weight. The dude who plays Scotty gained himself some weight. Um, Riker, Worf, Jordy, um, even Data, they all started gaining some weight. And so it happens, but that happens in the movies and we know why that happens and stuff. And so it's like, okay, so the question is, did they hire a person who is bigger knowing they're going to be in Starfleet uh, for a genuine reason or did they do it to exploit it? Um... Like I said before, in the first season, she was slimmer. So they probably just didn't know at that time. And then as time went on, she started getting bigger. And you can tell because of the outfits they put her in. The original Star Trek Discovery uniform is very, 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 very tight spandex. And it shows all your curves and stuff like that. And it showed all of hers. And that's when people started noticing she started gaining weight. And especially in the third season. In the third season, people, like, there was YouTubers all like, she was pregnant. I'm just like, what? I'm like, well, she is married, so that could be a possibility. And she did gain weight. So, of course, what you do, you research it. Can't find nothing on the subject matter of her having a kid. So, no, she just gained it just to gain it and stuff. And so, like... They kept putting her in all these unflattering clothes, like this baggy one outfit that her and Saru went into, and it clearly made her show that she was a, like bigger. Now, the thing that I said in my last video is the problem I had is that they exploited her weight by making her the butt of every joke. She is literally there to be the big comedian in the show, like a like a, a sitcom, you know, like um. King of Queens, that's a perfect example. Doug Heffernan, he's a big guy. He uses his weight to his comedy advantage. And he was the butt of that show. They done it in Mike and Molly. They've done it in Family Matters. Um, they do it whatever it is like a really heavier set person, especially when there's a kid. That, that, that kid, they like, it's like, they like, okay, you're big, so let's make you funny so people can laugh with you and not at you. Only problem is the writers made us laugh at her and not with her. So I feel like they exploited her weight um, as time went on only because they realized that Mary Wiseman is a funny person. And they're all like, hey, we can probably get some comedic humor similar to that of like the Orville and stuff. And it's shame on the writers. And Adira is the second person I remember who had some weight in the outfit because when they introduced Adira um, in the third season, she was in this like really tight spandexy like outfit and I could see like all her curves and stuff like that. And then of course they made Adira an officer in the fourth season 
And with these new outfits, you can't really tell a person's weight. However, they always turn Tilly and like the camera always puts her in that angle, like to the side where you can see her and stuff, making her look bigger than what she is. Cause then like, and then not only that, but the outfits are colorful. Now in Star Trek's past, a lot of the men were heavier set. You cannot tell because they made the guys wear and the females wear Spanx. And at some point, like in DS9 and up, their outfits were black. So you can't really tell. And that's kind of how Tilly is when she's in her away mission outfit, that, that phaser-proof vest thing. You can't really tell she's that big. But then when you put her back in her Starfleet outfit, and they always turn her to the side or turn her this way or make her fall down, you can clearly tell in their thing. And, and it's just like, I don't like when they do that to her because it's causing people to make fun of her online and it's really hurtful and everything. Now, would I have cast a big person to be in Star Trek if they was like Earth and in Starfleet? Because I'm a diehard Star, um, Star Trek fan and Gene Roddenberry's vision and all that, probably not. Um, even though I love big women and stuff like that only because like I said before in the future they have access to free health care and everybody's in tip-top shape you know what I'm saying and they're in the military so you're gonna have to be able to run and all this other stuff but is Starfleet really a military some people say it is some people say it's not um yeah I'm always getting so long in my um Tilly conversation like nine minutes again god they did that yesterday and stuff so um now, in the older Star Trek shows, when it comes to people, they forced everybody to be on a diet. And they had to wear Spanx on top of their costume. And so, like, or underneath their costume. Now, this rule was prominent for the females, I heard, and they would have gotten into a lot of trouble if they gained weight. The men, on the other hand, the men, for some reason, were allowed to gain weight, but not that much. But still, rules were put in place to make sure that everybody could fit in their space uniform and this and that, because they have to like resize it up and all this other stuff. Somebody did suggest one time that they should have made her go on a diet. Um, because they're so loose on this show, that's probably why they didn't. And they probably didn't want to hurt her feelings and they probably just wanted to accept her for who she is but at that same time they exploited it by making fun of like her weight by making her into that sitcom big person comedic person and stuff so i saved the best for last and this is the part that's going to be very confusing for me because i still don't quite understand everything that's going on in the world we live in today because everything is a change <laughs> Like, I thought I assumed I had, like, a handle on everything LGBT from, like, growing up and, like, what I researched and everything. But it seems to be new stuff popping up every day. And I can't keep up. And it's so confusing. And then when I research it and read up on it, it's the, I'm, I'm even more confused than I was before. <laughs> so, now, when both these stars were introduced for the show... CBS decided they was going to let the entire world know that. And it became quite confusing because they said for the first time ever, Star Trek is about to have a transgender and non-binary characters, not stars, but characters. And this made a lot of the fans be all like, um, we've had non-binary characters before. Um, they even made an entire episode about that in Next Generation. And then in Enterprise, they had that one species that had a third species. I never understood that episode. How do you have a third species? I guess they have like no body parts, um, sexual body parts that is. That's what I'm assuming. Um, and of course back then they weren't allowed to show nudity so you had no idea. And now that's when it comes to transgender characters on Star Trek. I, I don't, I never recall nobody having a sex change. Um, but there have been shapeshifters that go both male and female. So I guess that can be kind of considered. Now some people try to say Trill or like transgender, but I don't see them being that way. Um, the symbiote, sure because they can go into a male or female host, but like the, the, the host themselves never really, I, they only identify as one thing. So that confused a lot of fans. And cause they never said the actual stars, which is what they should have done. But then I'm just like, hmm, 
why did you advertise this for the whole world to see? Shouldn't this been something that the fans discover on their own and be shocked and like amazed by? And then I'm all like, I feel like they're being exploited a little bit, which CBS has done this before in Big Brother. When Caitlyn Jenner came out as, um, well, when Bruce came, turned into Caitlyn Jenner and um, became transgender, they decided to capitalize on that by having the very first transgender female in Big Brother history and they made sure they let everybody know that instead of letting her tell everybody and of course when she did get to the show she did have to tell everybody because it was in the headlines and all this other stuff and I'm just like you shouldn't have to tell who you are like when they have they cast a straight person on the show they never advertise it we're casting a straight person or when they have like a lesbian character or um a gay character they never advertise hey we have a gay or a lesbian character on the show like when you advertise it then you it, it, it's like hey look at us aren't we special we did something before you did and everything and that's how i feel with those two and that's how i feel with um the aubrey from big brother because big brother was banking on this because of so much praise caitlin jenner got at that time now caitlin jenner is hated and very much so and for good reasons and stuff and um and so they they was expecting the aubrey character to go very far they were not expecting that Aubrey would try to play the game too fast, too hard in the beginning and then have a complete meltdown and shut herself off to where she just stayed and hidden in the room and never came out and then broke the eating rule and got voted out. And I just feel like they exploited her and everything just to get like ratings and worship and awards and stuff like that. And I kind of feel that same way about Adira and Gray or at least the people that played them and stuff um now at that time when they was cast i don't think they had a wikipedia page but now they do and um so that would also make me confused as to who was who you know what i'm saying and i didn't bother reading the article because like i'm just like okay whatever i've discovered them on my own like i do with other shows and i don't like the idea that i think i read when it came to the idea um actress I can't pronounce her name, so I'm not even going to try. I'm tired of butchering people's names. I believe I read that um, that, um, that that star never even came out to their parents. And so when the show made that public, or well, they were about to make that public, and they're all like, hey, is this okay? We can make this public? And... Um, the Adira person's all like, well, I haven't even told my parents yet. So that person had to go tell their parents <laughs> and everything. And I'm just like, geez, like that person wasn't even ready to come out. And then here's the show, like, you know, making that like known and everything. It's almost like they put the Adira and Grey like stars on a pedestal and spun them around for the whole world to look at um, by trying to be like diverse. Um, I do feel one of the characters is probably more genuine than the other one, but the other one does absolutely nothing. Now, other shows, they have like transgender people and non-binary people and this and that. And, um, a lot of them don't exploit it. The CW did in Supergirl. They let everybody know the whole world. Hey, we're about to have our first transgender female on the show. And like I said before, C um, the CW is owned by CBS. Now, what many people don't know is that there is another transgender um, guy, male, that um, is on a television show and never once was that person ever like publicized. And that has to do with HBO Max's Titans season two, Jericho. I had no idea that the person was really deaf I had no idea that the person is um, also um, transgender male. I had no idea whatsoever. I thought for sure that person was born like a dude, you know what I'm saying? And so when I found that out, I found that out through another YouTuber. And cause you know, cause they didn't exploit that all over the world to see on the internet with like headlines and like an article. And I'm thinking to myself, see, that's how you do that and stuff. Like, you let people find out for themselves and you don't put people on a pedestal 
And when you put people on a pedestal, then it just makes it seem like, oh, you're looking for like applause and worship and, and, and ratings and, and make a certain group like, like you even more and get like an awards and stuff like that. And it's just like, it was more gratifying when you, it's, it's kind of like a spoiler. Like you don't want to be spoiled on a movie or a TV show with the internet the way it is now, everything's out there. And things are more better when you take it in for yourself and you digest it for yourself and you analyze it for yourself and you come to your own conclusions and your own praise or your own dislikes, you know what I'm saying? And so like, that's how I feel the Adira and Grey character were. And so, um, so like, yeah, I had really no idea which was which. I assumed the Adira person was a transgender. Um, cause I just didn't know cause back then they didn't have a Wikipedia page. Now they do. I just don't understand with the deer and gray why they like advertised it, you know, because it literally puts a person on a pedestal. And I think things are better when you experience it for yourself, because then you are more in shock, awe and amazed than somebody telling you like a good prime example, Disney Channel on that show, something Mac, Alex, Mac, um, Ali Mac, something Mac. I don't know. I've never watched it. Um, they had their very first gay character um on disney channel like prominent and stuff and they did not advertise it when people discovered that then it made headlines afterwards so it was more of a bigger thing um and it was and, and people responded very positive to it you know because they got the experience for themselves and you know without having to make up their mind ahead of time now the CW did something complete opposite twice on the same show, Supergirl. Around the second season, they advertised there's gonna be a like um gay or lesbian character. And it turned out to be um Supergirl's adoptive sister, Alex. And so like they advertised that before it ever happened, before people could discover it. Then later in the series, they reveal they're going to have their very first transgender like character and stuff. So of course, people of their group was happy and excited. <laughs> and that's what they so I had to clear my throat. And that's what they wanted. They wanted to get that praise. They wanted to get that, that get that out there. They wanted to make, and it's like, so it's kind of like, okay, I get Cause some people gonna take that okay that's cool you know somebody in my own campus like that but then it's kind of like oh you just did that so we will know be happy and excited and then watch the show and it would have been a whole lot more interesting if you know people would have discovered that on their own i feel like sometimes this show is disingenuous to who they cast on the show they're trying to be diverse which is great i love diversity but they're not doing it for the right reason. The similar way to the CW does it in a lot of their show, they're literally just checking off a box and, and that's it. There are some characters that are genuine, like, say, like as much as I hate Michael Burnham, you gotta give it up. She's a woman and she's a diverse woman of a different race and they do a lot with her, you know what I'm saying? But then let's go to the operations officer who is also a woman in black. They do nothing with her. Um, the woman next to her, Detmer, um, she's a woman. They do nothing with her. Um, Bryce, the black dude, they do nothing with him. His replacement, another black dude, nothing with him. Um, Reese, an Asian dude, they do nothing with him. And so it's just kind of like you see this pattern when it comes to Star Trek. They put all this stuff and stuff in there, but they don't do nothing with it. Alrighty, well, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.